Alright, hello everybody, my name is John Hammond, welcome back to another YouTube video. We're looking at PowerShell video number 4 in the series, checking out variables and some data types and PS drives. So let's dive into it. I'm going to fire up PowerShell. Alrighty, there we go. So, what we need to do, because we are so close to scripting and trying to do some really cool automated PowerShell stuff, but we need to dive back into what we mentioned just briefly in the other video on what variables are and what we can do with them. So, you've probably seen variables in tons of other languages, right? PowerShell has support for them because it's a language. So, the prefix that we need to specify this is a variable within PowerShell is that simple dollar sign symbol. And we can call a variable literally anything. In fact, I'll just call mine the word anything. And we can set that equal to, with our equal sign, any value that we want. So I'll just use a simple string here, the classic, and now that is created and available throughout the rest of the scope that we're going to be using PowerShell for. So I could go ahead and echo that out. Remember, echo is an alias for write host. Profile. I don't know why I'm thinking about that. That was just the last video. Our variable that we just created was anything, right? If we were to actually use a variable that didn't exist, it would just return nothing for us because that variable we haven't created yet. We haven't set a value to that. It's bare as nothing, as just an empty string. And a string is that bit of text or kind of English or variable, variable is the wrong word because that is in fact what we're using here, the dollar sign. The value doesn't need to just be English text. As a string, it could be maybe bytes or kind of opcodes or any other letters that we might end up using, or digits, etc., etc. Um, or it could be something else, like an integer, right? We could just check out uh, integer, we can set that to 100, or negative 100, or even a decimal sort of thing, like negative 10.1. However, that's no longer an integer, right? What is the type of that? We can find out by any of the variables that we create by using that kind of C style syntax. My mouse is just sitting here annoying us, I'm sorry. We had that integer and then if we had a period and that control space to help us autocomplete or suggest what we could be using, what we might want to do with that, we could see some of this information. We could run a get type method or kind of a function relative to that object, right? Because PowerShell is object oriented for us with all those C sharp and .NET kind of backend stuff that we see when we use commandlets like get child item or other things. Get type will return the type for us. And we can actually convert it to other types. We could to string or to integer or to decimal, etc., etc. So let's check out what we're working with here. This is get type and because it's a method or a function call that we're using, it's going to have those two parentheses that will kind of invoke it or call that. So opening parentheses, and it doesn't take any arguments, or so we saw. And that's a handy thing that we can actually see when we're looking at that helpful autocomplete suggestion stuff inside of PowerShell for us. So get type doesn't take any arguments. And if we return, that is in fact now a double. It's not a decimal number or an integer. There's actually a lot of properties that comes with this, which is really cool. So if you wanted to, you could get type, and then as we've done earlier, that FL star or format list to now retrieve everything that came out of it. There's a lot of information that this can hold for us. Scrolling through, a lot of nonsense. Some of it might be useful to us, but it actually has some fields and other information that might be valuable. So those are some of the data types and the types of variables we could actually end up supplying or using with our values inside of our variables. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. So what I want to show you, if I hop over to my Firefox over here, I wanted to bring this down so we can see it. If I actually get it on the right screen. Thank you. Okay. This is uh, ss64.com, which is an awesome resource for sort of a uh, command line and system languages. In this case, it says... This link is uh, ss64 slash ps for PowerShell and then hyphen syntax, I'm sorry, forward slash syntax hyphen data types.html. So we could use a string type or a character or a byte or integer or long or boolean or decimal or any of those things that we've already saw or some other neat things like XML or an array or a hash table, kind of like an associative array or dictionary. And it actually has some other kind of built-in variables, true and false, which are those Boolean values that we're used to. Python, you see them with a capital T true or capital F false. Um, in this case, it's just dollar sign and then lowercase for us. 
And you can actually cast some of these variables to that specific type, or to note this is what it's actually going to be. So that way, when I say enter a number with like a kind of a read in command, it won't store that value as a string. We can specify, hey, I actually want it to be an integer. I really want to get that real value. You can see they do that as an example here, int around the string 0064. So that's really known as a number 64. Or we can take the integer of false, which will just be zero, etc. Or we can even create bytes based off of the zero x syntax, and that's kind of neat and interesting. Again, you can define these with that declaration, with that type kind of attached to the variable, int even before the value, or on this side. However, when assigning the value to a variable, you can cast either side of the expression, so this is not quite the same as that. Interesting arrays, and they even have some data types like date, or things that PowerShell will give us that are much more interesting. So let me show you that. While we were able to run just off of our anything variable, right, we had anything, that was a string. So if I were to run get type on that, you can see, okay, that is a string. We can get the name out of that, or dot name, just get that value. But there's another commandlet in PowerShell that will show us get types and get type data. That's the full command up there. That'll return a ton of stuff and we can scroll through this and see some interesting things. And these are kind of variable types that PowerShell has already created for us or it knows just because it's managing our computer in a programmatic way, right? We have a system diagnostics process, like even a process itself that you might see within kind of get process as a commandlet. Let's try that. Make sure I'm not talking to my ear. There's a ton of stuff. Let's go ahead and select index. Uh, let's get first one. Good. And let's go ahead and run just get type off of that. So I'm going to wrap that in parentheses so I can check get type. And you can see the name is a process. If you wanted to kind of get more information out of that, I think it's a full name. Is that right? Yeah, system diagnostics process, and that's the string that we just saw when we ran get type data. There are a lot of really cool ones with this. There is a system.net mail, ma mail address. There's one for IP addresses. And if you actually wanted to filter some of this and see what is it really going to show me, or what are some of my options for some specific kinds of data, like a system.net IP address will have PowerShell automatically figure out whether or not this information that you provided is a valid IP address or is a valid email address as we saw. So you don't have to do that yourself. I see a lot of other people that might be trying to write PowerShell scripts and they're doing all this like string splitting and cutting and trying to verify, okay, is this really within the range of zero to 255, blah, blah, blah. PowerShell can do that for you because of this awesome data type that it's created, right? If we can access it with just IP address, let's find out. And you notice those square braces are what allowing us to actually specify this is the type that I want to use. So I'll specify a string just after that. We'll do 10, 0, 0, 1. And that is created for us. And it even has properties already. It gives us kind of an address family, whether or not it's a local address or not. If I were to change that to like 104, it says, okay, that didn't help me. <laughs> Bad example. But it will give us the value and other information that we might want. Let's run FL star on that to see everything that it might carry for us. There's not a whole lot else, apparently. Select star everything. Uh, select string, my bad. Let's just use select. That's all there is to it. But if I were to try and create that IP address with something that wasn't real, like a 256, right? It says, hey, that's not a valid IP address or maybe I had the right amount of octets, or I had the wrong amount of octets. Okay, I guess that one figured it out on its own for me. I guess that one will just do it automatically. Fill in zeros as needed. But maybe if something was out of range, it would say, oh, that's not quite right. That's interesting how it's doing some of that math. It knows, okay, with four octets, it's not gonna be able to do that correctly. So that's an IP address, kind of data type you can use within PowerShell, or we could use, what was that, that mail. If you ever forget it, you can get type data and search for mail. System net mail, mail address. So maybe we could just run mail address. Will that work? Yeah. Now let's run like john at gmail.com or whatever. It'll actually display our user kind of before the at sign and the host, 
just after the at sign and the full address. And of course, if I were to have that wrong, johngmail.com, or however typos I want to throw in there, uh, notice it'll error for us because we don't have our at symbol. It's not a real email address. Handy, right? That way you don't have to do the processing. PowerShell can do that for you. If you notice, okay, there's a wrong spot here. This isn't a real email address. It's not in the required form. So you don't have to do that processing. PowerShell can do that just as well for you. Now, we've created some of these variables. So we created this anything, and we created, uh, what was the other one, integer. But what I want to show you is that these are not the only variables that PowerShell is going to end up keeping track of. We've already seen profile. We've already seen that that is a variable that just created or, or was in existence. We didn't have to create it. It was there before we started PowerShell. So there's already some variables that are in existence, in scope, that maybe we want to know what they are. Just to explore and learn about PowerShell more, we can figure out what those are. So I want to introduce to you a new thing called PowerShell Drives, or PS Drives. And that is how PowerShell is going to kind of manage the context that you're working in within the shell, within PowerShell. Right now, we're inside of our file system, right? But PowerShell could also allow us to work inside of the Windows registry, or even kind of knowing the variables that we're working with and treating it like a file system, right? When we were able to run new item or move item or copy item, it's called item because it's not always the file system that we're working with. Maybe when we get child item, we get all this information out in our current directory, but maybe it's not so much a directory that we're looking at, but what if it's a hive in the registry or some specific scope for variables in their existence? So that's a thing called PS Drives, or PowerShell Drives. If I run get-ps drive, it'll tell me all of the different things that we can go ahead and navigate in and look around in. Aliases, we've seen those before with gal and get alias. Of course, our file system, or maybe some certificates that we have installed on the machine. Maybe another drive that's accessible to us. Environments, functions that are created, and of course, registries. And there's one for variables. So if I were to move into that PowerShell drive, we can explore these variables and work with them as if they were files, just running ls commands or get child item. So we can hop into the context of that PowerShell drive by kind of using the provider here, that PowerShell provider, and specifying a colon following it. So it just looks kind of like our C colon for our file system object, but instead it would be variable colon. So let's do that. Let me cd to variable colon. I'll hit enter, and you see that my prompt has changed. And now I'm inside a kind of a variable context. If I were to ls or get child item, we can see all of the variables that have been created thus far. Some of this is kind of ones that we've seen. We know true is going to evaluate to true, right? We actually have our version table for PowerShell. We have, if I were to scroll up here, maybe the profile that we've seen. Yep. The process ID for what we're working in. Null. We even have our integer variable that was created earlier. Or if I scroll all the way up, I don't know why my scroll bar isn't that good for uh, my virtual machine. We even have those special variables like what was the previous command that we ended up running? The dollar sign, dollar sign, the dollar sign question mark. What was the kind of error code or exit code that we were working with that last one? Our previous command or anything. That's that variable that we just created. There's others that exist in here, maybe errors that were happening earlier that we saw the very, very last error while we were running PowerShell. Can't convert that value when I was trying to showcase that email address. It stored that error, and now we could actually view that maybe if we were creating a script or writing something that might need to know what that error message was. So if I were to create a variable Z, 100 or whatever, if I were to ls, check those it again, now I have Z as a variable that exists and that value there. And of course, if we want to zoom in on one of those, we could, let's select the last one. And if I could select everything out of it, it tells me the drive and provider that it's in. Maybe a value, whether or not it's accessible. If it came from a module, will FL star give me any more information? I guess not. But that's that. 
You might have noticed, though, one that I kind of glossed over, was this ENV drive, or the environment drive. And this one stores environment variables, or variables that are kind of across the machine or accessible for uh, really the host and system that you're working with. So if I were to CD into environment, okay, sorry, it's not called a fully environment, it's called ENV. The name is what should be switched into, not the provider. That just tells us kind of what it is. So if I move into ENV, now if I were to LS, check out what we have here, we have some more information about this system that we hadn't seen before. Or some of those variables that you might be used to in kind of old school CMD, if we were to echo like, oh, win DIR, and that's wrapped around in those percent signs. These that were environment variables are now stored in that kind of dollar sign ENV win DIR. You can see that's that value that's shown to us right in this listing here. Same thing with our username or user profile or more information, where program data is, where program files are, where is our module path, what is our actual path for binaries or scripts or things that we try to run straight from the command line. App data, common users, computer name, etc., etc. That is how we can view all of that information. That's where we can kind of navigate with it and modify them inside of the PS drive, that PowerShell drive, and we can set those with specific types that we might want. So if I were to hop back to my variable drive, if I were to create uh, Z, make that now an IP address, we'll make it localhost. If I were to just check out what we have here, we have Z set to that value, but we can go ahead and grab that last one, kind of zoom in on it. Let's check out all of his properties. It tells me that it's just a variable. It won't tell me the actual type. Maybe there's a way that I just don't know about yet. Hope you guys can teach me a little bit, help me learn. Wonder if I can just grab that and see some other information with it. The period, nope. Oh, that was odd. I want to do control uh, period there. There's nothing there. It won't let me. I can't, can, maybe I can get member out of this and see what else, what other information's there to string. We can still run get type on that. That works just as well. Tells me it's a PowerShell variable, not the specific type that it's actually in. Is there full name? No. Interesting. So maybe within the context of variable, that PS drive, we won't be able to see it work all that well. Now, because I created that variable in there, is it still accessible for me inside of C? Yes, which it is. And then can I run get type on that and will it tell me it's an IP address? It will. Interesting. Okay, I'm learning too. This is a very exploratory thing when we're using PowerShell. So that's that. That's really all that I wanted to show you in this video was what these variables are, how they can store information, data, and the types of data that can come with it. That SS64 reference is awesome. You should check that out, see what more you can learn from there. And know if you scroll through that get hyphen type data, there are other kinds of PowerShell types that you might be able to use in some of your later scripts or code that will kind of minimize the work that you need to do, like trying to validate, is this really an IP address or is this really an email address? That's nice and handy for us. And these things live and you can access them within some of those PowerShell drives, PS drive or we could navigate around our registry or other file systems or even certificates and aliases. So that's kind of neat. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please do like, comment, and subscribe, all those YouTube algorithm stuff. Uh, I'd love to see you in the Discord server. There is a link in the description. You want to come hang out. Tons of smart people in there, so much smarter than me. It's a really awesome community, and I would just love to see you a part of that. So. Love to see you on Patreon. Love to see you on PayPal. Love to see you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebooks, all the things. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.